Welcome to Institute Technology Kalimantan, a science and technology driven university with a regional and global focus. Founded in 2012, Institute Technology Kalimantan, or ITK, was a part of the Indonesia government's plan to establish more state institute of technology outside of Java Island. With a long consideration and the results of the feasibility study, the city of Balipapan was finally determined to be the perfect location for the plan, as it's known as one of the substantial gateways to Kalimantan. In 2014, ITK was finally inaugurated by the sixth president of Indonesia with its first rector, Professor Dr. Insignor Sulistiano Iie. The existence of Institute Technology Kalimantan or ITK as an educational institution in Eastern side of Indonesia is intended to prepare qualified human resources to face the master plan for acceleration and expansion of, of Indonesia's economic development. On the way to become a world-class university, ITK always expands in study program, learning system, facilities, and other support in the learning process. Being the first state institute of technology in Kalimantan, ITK strives to become a superior university and to have an active role in national development through empowering potentials of Kalimantan region by 2025. To fulfill the bright vision, ITK continues to grow with three main missions. ITK now has 21 bachelor programs with prospective scientific fields, including Mathematics Informatics Information Systems Actuarial Science Statistics Digital Business Physics Naval Architecture Ocean Engineering Food Technology Mechanical Engineering Electrical Engineering Chemical Engineering Industrial Engineering Safety Engineering Logistic Engineering Civil Engineering Urban and Regional Planning Architecture Environmental Engineering and Materials and Metallurgical Engineering Along with the expansion of study programs, ITK keeps advancing various laboratories with modern technology equipment to support student competencies and skills. Various types of areas and spaces are also available for students to learn together, to work on projects, or to deliver presentations. To evolve in the midst of a rapidly growing digitalization era, ITEGA provides many ways for students to reach knowledge, both online and offline. ITEGA also makes it easier for students to take care of educational Supporting the advancements of research and technology, ITK also encourages students to express themselves creatively. ITK has various student activity units which support student development from arts to entrepreneurship. By supporting the balance between knowledge and creativity, it will empower the maximum potential of the student. It is marked by the achievements that lead ITK to gain national and international recognition. ITK always believes that learning is no longer sitting in one place, but here and anywhere 
European collaborations. ITK supports Campus Merdeka, a program initiated by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology of Indonesia. Besides the student exchange programs, ITK has established certified internship programs with various corporate objectives, both state-owned and private companies. As a commitment to community service, ITK always has an aspiration to create innovation that could help the society to grow with technology advances. ITK will always continue to collaborate and build synergy with the government, industry, and higher education. By providing it all, it leads students to learn beyond the classroom, to foster global awareness and collaboration, so they could be more empowered and well-equipped to step towards the future. Iteka is always committed to be more advanced and become the barometer of high education in the Eastern Indonesia region. Starting from Kalimantan, for the better Indonesia. Hi, Roy. Yes. Hi, Ricky. Sorry, I'm just setting up my video. Okay, no worries. Ah, cool. Excellent. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Yeah. So we're going to wait for a few minutes to let everyone join us. Okay, it's okay. Can I just check? I can share my video. Oh, sure. Uh, sorry, I'm just, I've got stuff in the way. Right. Uh, yeah, I need to be, I have given access to share. Okay. Um, I will ask someone else. Yeah, normally it's nice to, if you make me co-host, that makes, allows me to share. Okay, yeah. Let me tell them. Who is the cause? By Irma? I think. Check, check, by Irma. Wait. Hello, Vicky. Hello. Kaput. Okay. How are you? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Um, I can't share my screen, so I really need to let um me share my screen or make me co-host and that'll allow me to do yeah. that. Yeah.
Okay, I think there is some little problem with the connection, I think. Yeah. Wait a minute, right? Okay, Prof. Uh, now you are as a host. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. I can see a screen now. Uh, and, and just to check, it moves forward. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Cool. And well, last question, can you see my cursor? Yes, as well. Fantastic, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Cool. So I think we're just gonna start now. So we'll maybe waiting for everyone to join us later. So, okay, we'll just greet everyone first. So welcome everyone. Good afternoon, my fellows in Indonesia. Yeah, and good morning, Ruth. Yeah, hope everyone is doing well and still in high spirit. Uh, because today is everyone is fasting, including me. So yeah, please uh, don't ever say it. it's almost uh, after time. So uh, help everyone still in very high spirit to to watch and listen today's webinar. So we have very special guests today, uh, Ruth King from University of Edinburgh. Uh, she is my supervisor as well. So just a little brief introductions. Uh, she is a senior lecturer at the School of Mathematics and also Thomas Bias Chair of Statistics at the University of Edinburgh. She was president of uh, IRIS, I'm sorry, International Biometric Society for I, uh, British and Irish region and also an elected member of the Royal Society uh, Council. And also wrote I as uh, associate editor for several reputable journals such as Jabez Biometrics. And today, uh, she is going to present about the hidden Markov models. So we're gonna listen and see. Uh, before we start for today's webinar, a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any question during the presentation, please type your question in the chat box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up uh, during the Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I think I will give uh, to present uh, his, his, her talk today. Bro, time is yours now. Thank you very much, Ricky. Um, and it's my, my great delight to be speaking my first time um, in Indonesia. Uh, while I'm sat in Edinburgh, admittedly. Um, so yes, I mean it's 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 my great uh, delight to be here, and, I, and um, it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning for me, so um, it's slightly different time time zone. So hopefully I'm awake though, um, and I'm going to be talking today about um, hidden Markov models, uh, and these. Um, I'll give an introduction to these, these, what these models are, and then in particular why I'm really interested in them, because a lot of work that I do is in statistical um, ecology, and 
it's not necessarily clear immediately what the connection is, but I'm going to work you, walk you through that connection and show why they are so interesting and, and the advantages of thinking about statistical ecology and the particular uh, models and data I'm interested in, why we want to think about them as hidden Markov models. Basically, it makes our lives much, much simpler. So, um, just to give a brief overview um, of my talk, I'm, sorry, I'm going to start giving you an introduction about hidden Markov models. So this is going to be a general introduction. Um, and that'll be, so I'm not assuming you know anything about these, and we'll talk about them. Then I'm going to switch tack completely, and I'm going to start talking about statistical ecology. And in particular, I'm going to be focusing on, on something called capture-recapture uh, data. So this is subwork that um, is related to stuff that Ricky has been working on. Uh, but in a slightly different different way. And then I'm going to combine the two together and show that we can think about capture recapture type models as hidden Markov models and then the advantages and so on of what that brings brings to us. Um, and I'll do a brief, very brief summary of, of what I've been talking about. So sort of in two halves um, you can think of this this talk. And the first one I'm going to start about is the hidden Markov models. So to give an idea of why uh, of what hidden why we might be interested in hidden Markov models, I'm going to start by doing some motivation by looking at some types of data that we have. So we're going to be looking at longitudinal data, so data that's recorded over time. And typically we have large amounts of um, time steps. Uh, and, and we just observe, I'm going to assume it's univariate data over time, but it can be multivariate. And we assume those denoted by x's. Um, so we have these, initially we're going to assume that the time difference between the different time steps is, is regular. I'll come back to that later. But we have t time steps. And the data we have, I've just given three examples. Um, the first top left one is looking at telemetry data. So um, looking at animal movements. And we're looking at just how far they move between each time step. So this is just the distance moved between each time step. Top right is uh, to do with um, health record data. Uh, and here we're looking just heart, someone's heart rate um, over time while they're in an intensive care unit. And the third example at the bottom is to do with uh, share prices over time. So if we look at each of these three um, longitudinal data sets individually, there seems to be some pattern in them. So if you look, just look, we go through, if you look at the telemetry one, you can see that there's some time where we get big steps. Big animals are moving long distances between time steps, in, for example, in red. And other times, uh, they don't move very far at all. They might be moving very, very slow. So you, it might be um, representative of an animal is moving between two areas. Um, they might want to get from A to B. They want to get there quickly, so they take long time steps. Once they get to area B, they might be looking for food and foraging around. So then they start taking small time steps. Um, so you can see there's, there's some pattern here that there's differences in what we observe over time. Um, similarly, if you look at the electronic health record, we can again observe different patterns in the data over time. So different things are happening. We start off with um, sort of relatively stable heart rate. Then it seems to suddenly dip and there's a, it's a bit more variable um, coming in there. And then you can see there's an upward trend at the end. So again, there's sort of three different, uh, three different sort of patterns going on in the data. And then for share prices, again, um, we can perhaps observe that there's different variability going on here. We start off with there's some, some volatility, sort of average volatility, for example, as it goes. Then it decreases. The variability of the share prices decreases. Then it goes up. Again. And then there's huge um, variability. So you've got much more volatility. Um, so if we want to model these types of data, we need to take into account that there might be something else going on here. And this is, it, this is um, impacting what we observe in the data. So you, again, I'll keep coming back to the ecological idea. So I'll keep that in our mind if you think about animals um, uh, moving for the moment and how they might be moving and so on. But we see, so this is a, these are very, very general types of data. Longitudinal data arises everywhere, ecology, health, finance, basically engineering, anything you can think of, we get longitudinal data over time and we want to see what's understand what's happening. But there's something else going on. It's not, it's not stationary over time. That we're getting different patterns at different times. 
And, and this is what then motivates the idea of hidden Markov models, that we have something that's affecting what we're observing over time. So again, come back to what we have before. We've got some observed data that we're looking at over time, but there's something underlying that's influencing this. So we have underlying influences. So again, think back to, um, oh, I'll start with the health one. We had the heart rate um, over time. Well, how, what affects heart rate? It could be, if you're sat at a computer like we are now, um, then our activity level is low, our blood pressure or our heart rate is likely to be low. If we started, I've just walked here um, to my office, and that might be then that was obviously going to increase my heart rate, my blood pressure. If I was doing a really active um, exercise, I was going for a run, then my heart rate's going to go up again. So you could think if we got different um, what sort of states that might affect what we observe in our data over time. Uh, if we go to the ecology again, as I said before, so that's sort of the one I'm going to be sort of more focusing on. If we think of a GPS location, um, where an animal is, then that may also be dependent on what it's doing. So if it's moving between areas, then you'll see it's moving, its step length will be large. Um, if, however, it's then started to feed, then the GPS location is going to be much more closely um, uh, close together because we're staying in an area looking for food or grazing, whatever we're doing. So we have different behavioural states of foraging, where we'll observe something different in our data compared to moving um, or resting and so on. Um, so we want to take these, we have to take these sort of underlying behavioural influences into account when we model the data. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense because these are having an impact on the data. So for, no, for our observed data, um, that can be discrete or continuous valued. For now, I'm going to assume that this underlying influence that's, in, that's in, impacting what we observe is discrete valued. So, you know, discrete set of states that we could possibly in. Again, foraging, resting, moving, or exercise, you know, low to high uh, medium, and so on. And I say these, exa these are just simple examples I've pulled out. Um, but these occur everywhere. So when we're thinking about, we have this data that we want to model because we want to understand what's driving the data and so on, we need to take into account these underlying influences or these underlying states. And that's where the hidden mark of model comes in because that's exactly what it does. So this is the uh, representation of what the, the hidden mark of model is that takes into account that we want to model the data, but take into account these underlying states. That means that what we observe is, they, is going to change over time and dependent on what we're doing. Are we resting? Are we foraging? Or so on. So this is, this is a graphical representation of the data. The Xs are the observed data that we had before. Just that's what we observe. But we want to take into account these underlying influences. So we have another coupled process with this, uh, which is denoted by S is here, which is our underlying discrete state. What are we doing at that particular time? Um, and then this is then how, how they are related to each other. So the nice thing about hidden Markov models is, is that we can decouple what's influencing and what's acting on the system at any one, uh, at the different levels. So we have two different levels. We have what is happening at the underlying state level. So that was what I called about an underlying influence previously. And now I was going to refer to that as a state. So we have what is our underlying state and how is that changing over time? How do we, are we resting? Are we foraging and so on? Um, and that's called the system process. And that describes this state, underlying state over time. And uh, for standard hidden Markov models, um, the reason they're called Markov models is that we assume that how the state changes over time is a first order Markov process, which means that uh, the state that you're in at time t plus one only depends on the state that you're in at time t plus some other model parameters that describes how you change over time. So that means it doesn't matter what, what you were doing any time before time t, what state you're in at time t plus one only depends what you do in the time before. So it's called a memoryless property. We just have to think, it doesn't matter what we were doing before, it just matters where we are, what state we're in now, what state we're going to be in at the next time. I'll come back to that again later. Um, and that's, and that, so that's, that describes you say, what state we're in over time. But then we also have to relate, well, what do we observe? That's what, that's what we, the data is, the, the observed data. So we assume that the data we observe just depends on the underlying state at that time. So this is the, 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 the vertical arrow here. 
So that means that what we observe just depends on our current state and again, nothing that's gone before. This again can be relaxed, I'm not really going to come back to this much later, but again, this is just sort of the basic model, there's lots of extensions to this. So, to summarise, we've got the hidden Markov model, we've got these underlying discrete states, which are called the system process, and the system process describes how those discrete states change over time, and then on top of that, we have the observation process, which says, what do we observe given the state that we're in? And that then is used to describe many of those models that you've just seen, so that we have these different behavioural states that depend on the different behavioural states, what we're likely to observe, whether we're in a high or low activity region and so on. So that, that's all what HMMs, I'll stop saying hidden Markov models, I'll call them HMMs now. That's um, sort of the, the idea of what they are and, and sort of um, some of the mathematical detail. I'm not going to go too much into the mathematical detail or I'll show some maths, but actually it's more the idea that I want to get across, not the specific maths. Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to use these hidden Markov models to fit to these um, longitudinal data sets where we have... Um, non-stationarity, so the, the observed data what changes dependent on what state that we are we are in. And we're typically interested in learning about all the different, the, we want to understand the system given the data that we see, and that can be both in terms of the system process, that's normally what we're quite interested in, um, but also we might be interested in the parameters in the observation process, typically less so. And particularly in my case, I'm not really interested in them at all, they're nuisance parameters, we just want to understand what the underlying system process. But I'll come back to that later. So what do we have for our HMM that we need to consider? So we're going to split this up into three parts um, when we come back to these. We have what do we know, what do we do, what don't we know and what might we um, be interested in and then how do we put these together with the hidden Markov model. So what do we know? We know our data, we observe our data. So we observe all our data and we just know that just by x, which is x1 up to xt this time series. The other thing we know is how many latent states that we have. So how many of these states do we observe? Um, or how many states are there in the underlying process? And they're called latent states because we don't know them. So I should have said we don't know this, the underlying latent states. We only see the data. However, we do know how many possible states there are. So again, if we were um, thinking back to the ecological example, we may have a resting state, a foraging state, and a moving state. So we'd have three states. So we know how many states there are. That's what, that's what we know. What we don't know are what state, which of these latent states we're in at each time point. That's completely unobserved. The other thing we're interested in, and probably we're more interested in than the latent states, we might be interested in them, but we typically want, and want to be able to estimate the model parameters, because that tells us something about the system that we're interested in. And we denote those by, by theta, and I've split them up into the parameters associated with the system process, and the parameters associated with the observation process, but that's that's not really that important. We're just going to theta what we want to estimate. So we have our knowns, we have our unknowns, what we want to learn about, and then in order to do that, we, we put these together in our model components for the hidden, hidden Markov model. And this is just simply our system process and our observation process. So our system process, um, we split into two parts. We have what's called the initial state distribution, which is simply um, a parameter that says what's the probability, uh, so it's a function of the parameters, sorry, which is the probability that we're in each state at time at the very first time point. And then we have what's more interesting is the what's called the transition probability matrix, which tells us how do we move from each of the different states over time. So it's simply the probability of moving between these dis different discrete states at each time point. And often we'll assume that is, is constant over time, so it's homogeneous over time. Uh, doesn't have to be. So that, that transition probability matrix is something we're normally particularly interested in. How would we move between these states? So that's, that describes our system process. And then, um, also I should say, the initial state distribution is denoted by delta and the transition probability matrix by gamma. So that's a capital gamma. And then we also have our observation process. How do we link? What do we observe given that the state that we're in? And that then just is, is the observation process and that's denoted by Q. Um, these are written in matrix form, and that'll become clear why we've written these in matrix form um, in a minute. Again, the, it's not important the next details, um, but the idea of what we have. System process, delta and, and gamma, and the observation process um, denoted by Q. 
and they system process and observation processes. So we now have all the ingredients of the HMM. Now we want to actually fit a HMM to some data. And then the way we do that, typically, whether we want to be classical or Bayesian, doesn't matter, we will do this um, by forming the likelihood function. Um, so our likelihood function is simply a function of the data, the likelihood of the data given the parameters. Now, the problem is this is not so easy to write down because we can write down the observation process and the system process as a function of the underlying states but the latent states are unobserved. So when we write our likelihood of just the data, the observed data given our parameters, we have to it's sum over all the possible states that we could be in at each time. This numbers, the number of summations we have to do is really, really large if we write it in this form. However, because of the first order hidden Markov, sorry, the first order Markov property for the system process, we can simplify this. I'm not gonna go through the details, but we can just simplify this in this in this form and this is and this is in matrix form which is why i represented it on the previous slide so again don't worry too much about the, the the details but just the concept here that we just have our likelihood can be written as our initial state distribution times by um, our observation process at time one and then we product over all the other times and we have um, the underlying system process times the observation process so how we move between the states the straight transition probability matrix and um the observation process. So we can write it, this is the important thing, we can write down the hidden Markov model very easily um, and it's efficient to calculate. So other things we might want to do, as well as we've got the likelihood we can now fit this today to maximize it, combine it with a prior to calculate a posterior, whatever you want to do. There are other things we might want to do. One is that well, so we, we're now estimating the parameters because we have the likelihood function, but we might actually be interested in those other unknown states. And we can do that by called state decoding. Um, two th things we can do. One is we can use the Viterbi algorithm, for example, to calculate the most likely state you're in at each time point. Um, so we just have here, we just got an example with two states and it just says what, which ones you're most likely to be in. But we can actually do something a little bit um, fine detail than that. And rather than just having this binary zero one classification, which state you're in, we can actually calculate the probability that you're in each state, which gives you finer level information. It gives you some level of the, of the uncertainty associated. So for pure, for example, we're very, very clear that we're, we're in state one, probability is very high. For this point, well, we're much more unclear. This, you know, this is close to 0.5 of what state this, the animal or the, in, the individual is at, at that time. So we can do that. We can also do extensions. Um, this is something I, I, I alluded to earlier, and I said, we assume that we have a first order uh, marker process in our system process, so it's memory less. The state we're in at time t plus one only depends on the state we're in at time t. If we do that, um, it's quite, it works reasonably well in many cases, in many examples, but not all. Um, and it has some undesirable properties in certain cases, um, in particular, if we assume that the how we change over states is constant over time, so it's a homogeneous called a homogeneous hidden Markov model, then we have how long you stay in any given state as a geometric distribution, which has a mode at one. So you only the most likely is you're going to stay in a state is time one, and that's not very sensible for many situations. Again, thinking back to an animal situation, um, if we think about an animal, how long uh, we look at the underlying behavioural state is its hunger state, hungry or not hungry. If it's eating, if an individual starts eating, it's not going to suddenly switch from, from foraging to resting because it's still, it's still hungry properly. It needs to feed for some time before it fills up. Um, so it's not very realistic in that situation. However, you can extend um, hidden Markov models, to called semi-Markov models, that um, is a really neat idea. Um, this is particularly work done by Ronan Langrock in his PhD. Um, and you can reparameterize the model so that you, you now have a more flexible model, so you no longer have a geometric distribution of how long you stay in a state, you can specify that to be a general one, so pass on negative binomial. Um, and the problem there is if you do that, it's very easy to say that, but writing down the, it breaks that likelihood, that nice likelihood function. And what Roland did in his PhD was show that um, you can approximate a semi-Markov model with a first order hidden Markov model. Not gonna go into details, it's not not necessary, uh, but just we can do these things um, and we can do them efficiently. Another thing uh, we can do is that I've said at the moment that the underlying states are discrete valued. Um, so you know, we're hungry, not hungry. 
we can make them continuous valued. And then that moves us into this what's called a state space model uh, framework. Again, this now became think makes more complicated because previously we did we had a summation because we had to sum over the unknown latent states. Now we have to integrate out over the unknown latent states. The integral is analytically intractable, except in the special case where we have linear and Gaussian. Um, and there's some interesting areas there. But one thing I think is really, really interesting and, and underused um, in the world is that we can actually estimate a state space model by a hidden Markov model by doing a discretization of the continuous space. Um, and again, I might, I'll touch on that later, which is a cool idea. Another thing we can do is relax the um, regular time interval. So at the beginning, I said we assume that we have regular time intervals um, between the observations. And the reason for that is we have the transition probability matrix. It says the probability of move between states. Well, if we've got different times between different states, uh, between, sorry, between observations, then that doesn't make much sense for transition probability matrix. The probability of move between states is that probability is likely to be how long there are, you are, the, the, the gap between the states if they're irregular. So I assumed they were regular. However, you can you can extend this to continuous time where you have irregularly spaced time points and then you to change your transition probability makes matrix and now you write it um, you have a generator function which takes into account the time between observations. Um, and again so so just to make the point you can do this so you can relax that. So that's all I'm really going to say about hidden marker models. It's a really, really fast um, introduction to them. But if you do want to know more, I would strongly recommend the book by uh, Walter Sacchini, Ian MacDonald and, and Roland Mangrock. It's a fantastic book um, about hidden Markov models. So, um, so there's loads more to do with hidden Markov models that can be said. Um, if you want to know more, that's always my first reference. Right, so now I'm going to, that's sort of the first part of the talk over, that's sort of the introduction to HMMs. Now I'm going to completely change and talk about my actual research area in statistical ecology. So it's, a lot of work I do is, is the work of ecological data, um, and we're interested in under, understanding about the underlying processes that drive many things we could be interested in. For example, abundance, um, particularly for conservation and management. And one of the things, one of the main demographic things we're interested in about with, with um, ecological populations is the survival probabilities of animals, because that feeds into um, understanding might be interesting in what affects their survival, and that really is one of the drivers of the population. Um, and the particular type of data that I'm going to be looking at is, is called capture recapture data. Um, but this is just a small part of, of work in, in, um, in, in ecological data. There's loads of other types of data. I'm just going to be focusing on this with this one. And it's quite prevalent in, in it because it's it, we'll see why it's very useful because we can actually estimate the things we're interested in survival probabilities and also abundance, so I won't really talk about that. So, I said I'm interested in capture recapture data. What, what is this data? So, in order to get capture recapture data, we set up a, a study um, and we have a set of discrete time points. So again, we have longitudinal data um, of discrete capture events over time. So this is basically the biologists go out into the field at a series of capture occasions. The first time they go out, at time one, any animals that they observe, they capture, uh, uniquely mark and release. And then they go out at each subsequent capture time, any new animals that they see, they capture, they uniquely mark and release. Any animals they've seen before, because they're uniquely marked, we can identify them as having seen them before. So we just record we've seen them and let them go. And we do this. Now, I said capture, we don't always capture animals. Pre traditionally, in order to uniquely um, identify animals, they were caught and they put a ring on their leg for their birds or put a tag in their ear for, um, for, la uh, for sheep or sea of seals or tags in their flippers and so on. Now, actually, we not necessarily always need to capture animals because sometimes we can do this by, we don't need to put physical markings on because we can use um, patterns on the skins of, of the animals in order to uniquely identify them. So tigers, leopards, um, it's a great crested newt on the left. We can use the pelage as unique ID identifiers. So our data then is actually really simple. It's just binary data effectively of a big matrix. So we have a big matrix where each row corresponds to each individual animal that we've observed at some point in the study. And the row and the columns correspond to each capture occasion. And then the entry for the matrix is simply a zero or a one a zero meaning that we did not see that animal at that given capture occasion. 
and a 1 is we did see that animal at that given capture occasion. And that, so that's our big binary matrix. And what we have is um, each row is simply a capture history telling us when we saw that given animal. So this animal we saw it at times 1, 3, 4 and 7. So we, this, is, this is our data now, our set of capture histories. So, uh, what are we interested in? Well, I'm going to particularly focus on where we're interested um, in survival. And so I'm going to be looking at where we have capture occasions spread out over time and we have an, what's called an open population. So we may have births, deaths um, or migration. So animals may enter or leave the population. Um, and, I said, and so just think of it, I'm just going to, for simplicity, I'm going to assume that each capture occasion is one year. It doesn't have to be, but this is just for simplicity of, of talking about it. And then there's a, um, I said, we're particularly interested in the survival probabilities of the animals. That tells us something about the demographic and how long they're likely to live and, and lots of things along those lines, particularly then for conservation and management. And then we're going to look at what's called the Cormac Jolly Seba model. So this model dates to the 19, it was developed in the 1960s. And it's still it's sort of the foundation stone of much of this uh, type of, of, of models. And for these models, I call them CJS models, um, we just have two model parameters effect, or two sets of model parameters. We have the survival probabilities and we have the capture probabilities because we don't see animals with certainty. We have to allow that we, we're imperfectly observing individuals. And for now, I'm just going to assume that the parameters are, are time dependent, but we can have lots of other interesting dependencies, age, we can have its functional covariates and so on. Some of that we'll come back to later. So then, um, how do we write down the likelihood of, of the CJS model? Well, the likelihood um, is relatively straightforward to write down. All it is, is um, we assume each individual conditionally independent of each other. So the, prob the likelihood of the data, or the probability of the observed data, given the parameters, because individuals are conditionally dependent, we can just product over each individual and calculate their corresponding capture probability. The one thing we do do, though, is we condition on the first time we observe an animal. So we can't actually estimate um, uh, entries into the population or birth rates. We're interested in estimating sort of uh, survival probability, so exits from the population. So our likelihood is simply the probability of the capture history for individual given the first time they're observed. So we can just think about an, a single capture history now, because we just product over all capture histories. So once we can write down the probability of a capture history, we've got now our um, full likelihood. So for example, if we just look at this, this capture history here, the they were first observed at time three, there, and then they were observed at time five and not seen at times four and six. Well, what's the probability of this history? We condition on the first time that they see, that they see, and so at time three, so we, we just start at time three. And look at what's the probability of having a 1010 history? Well, um, we can think about well, what happens between each time, but between times, we know an individual must be alive between times three and five because we assume that um, once you die, you stay dead. Uh, so times three to time four, we know we must survive. So we get uh, phi three. We're not seen at time four. So probability we are not observed. We must be alive, we get a survive again from time four to time five. We are now observed at time five, so we have the probability of being observed at time five. And then we have the probability of not being observed again after the study. And we can write this down. I'm not going to go into details, but we can write this down fairly, fairly straightforwardly. That was just a simple example. More generally, we can write this then for any capture history as a function of whether we observe an animal or not from their first time point and so on. So we can write down their capture history, and it always follows the same way. That's the probability, given that they're seen at the first time point, t0. We have what is the probability of their capture history up until their last time point, so they must have always survived, and then whether they're seen or not at each of those times, times probability we don't see the animal again. So that's, that's, that's fairly straightforward. So we can write down the likelihood. So what on earth has all this got to do with hidden Markov models? Um, all this was done in the 1960s, CJS model, hidden marker models didn't come in until after that. But what's really interesting is, is that we can actually write the CJS model as a hidden Markov model. Now, we can do the CJS model anyway, but we'll see that we're going to make our lives a lot more complicated 
and it makes our, it does become a lot more complicated if we want to do the idea of writing down the likelihood explicitly. What we're going to do instead is to write the CJS as a hidden Markov model, and then just, it's very easy to adapt that for more complicated models and, and things that we want to introduce. So we're always going to find that we have lots and lots of well, skeletons in the cupboards that we're always going to be able to come back to a hidden Markov model. So now let's. So what we're first going to do is put the CJS model into the form of a HMM. So let's think what we had. We had three sets of ingredients for the HMM. We had what we know, what we don't know, and then the, how we do the model components. So let's think, what do we know? Well, the, our data, we know our data, and that's just our binary matrix of when we observe each animal or not. And we have two possible latent states, alive and dead. Now, I should say this isn't a true hidden Markov model in the sense that in a true hidden Markov model, we don't know any of the underlying states, typically. In a hidden mark in, in the CJS uh, representation, we do actually know, because we're having alive and dead states, we do, if we see an animal, we know it's alive. So we know some of the states with certainty. So it's, I often call it a partially observed hidden Markov model. It doesn't make any difference to the formulation, but I just thought I'd make that an observation. So our known data um, is our, our capture histories and our uh, number of latent states is two. What don't we know? Well, we don't know our latent states. Well, I said we do know some of them, but we don't know what happens after an animal um, is no longer observed. It could die or it could be survived and we just don't see it. But we just, you know, we're just going to call them all latent states where the, and they are um, alive and dead. And then we had our model parameters, which in our case is just simply the survival and recapture probabilities. And now we need to put our model components together. So remember, our model components were three parts. There was the initial state distribution, the transition probability matrix, which just tells you what the probability of being either in the first, uh, in each state at time one or thereafter, the probability of moving between states. And then we have the observation process matrix, probability of what we observe given the state that we're in. And we just need to define these matrices. So let's start, go through each component in turn. We have our transition probability matrix, which says how, what's the probability of moving between each of the different states? Well, we've only got two states, alive and dead. So we have a two by two matrix. So the first element is what's the probability of moving between alive and alive? Well, that's the probability we stay alive. Well, that's just our phi survival probability. Probability we go from alive to dead. Probability we die. Probability we go from dead to alive is zero. We, we once um, probability we go to dead, we stay dead. Once we're dead, it's one. So death is permanent. It's an absorbing state. Um, our initial state, our, our initial state distribution is what state are we in when we're first observed? Well, when we're observed, we know we're alive. So there's no uncertainty. With probability one, we're alive. And then we have our observation process matrix. And now we have to consider this. De it depends on what what our observed data is. So it depends on our x. Well, there's two possibilities. x is either 0 or 1, depending on whether we are not observed or observed. So let's consider the case when x is, is naught. We're not observed. So then we have two components which correspond to what's the probability of not being observed given we're in state 1 or state 2. State 1 is alive. So probability we're not observed given we're alive is 1 minus p, probability we're not observed. Probability we're not observed given we're dead is 1, because we cannot be observed if we're dead. Well, again, we'll relax that in a minute, but for now. Um, and then what happens when we're, if we're observed alive? Then the probability we're observed given we're alive is simply p. Probability we're observed if we're dead is naught. We can't be observed if we're dead currently. Um, so that basically defines our all our model components. And then our likelihood contribution for a given capture history I don't have to do any work. This is the standard HMM likelihood. I didn't have to do any of those calculations that I did before deriving the likelihood. I just literally have to write down these three parts, the transition probability matrix, the observation process matrix, and the initial state distribution. And the HMM does the rest for me. It's why I like them. So that, that, that's it. That's all we have to do. So it's not necessary for the CJS model, the basic CJS model, to do all that, that perhaps rigmarole. We've already got the likelihood. But the point is the CJS model is a foundational model. We can make it much, much more complicated. And, as, as, and that's what I'm going to do now for the rest of the talk, is just show you how do we make this more complicated. 
what are the different things we might want to do? And then what does that mean for maybe writing down the explicit likelihood or how can we then do this in the HMM framework? And we'll see that the, doing this in the HMM framework, relaxing assumptions or adding in extra complexity is much easier in the HMM framework. So, um, just this is just, this is basically saying what I've already said, I think. Um, it's really easy. Each time we just need to define our initial state distribution, transition probability matrix, observation process matrix. So let's show some examples of this. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to relax the assumption that we cannot see um, dead individuals. So up to now, we've only able to see live, uh, recapture live individuals. We can extend that, and this is now called capture, recapture, recovery data, where we, we can recover dead individuals. So let's think about this in the traditional way. Um, our data, now previously it was binary, now it's tertiary, because we can have unobserved, observed alive, but now we can also be recovered dead. Our model parameters stay um, the same previously, but now we have to add in an extra um, recovery probability because the recovery probability of a dead individual is typically different from the recapture probability of a live individual. And we and, and note we only assume that we can recover recently dead individuals and for reasons for this that you know, um, we lose the tags and so on. Or if, if we're using unique markings on their skin, of course, if their body decomposes, we lose those markings. We can't observe them. So we have to assume that an animal can only be recovered if it's died in the last time point. We, or we don't have to, but this is a basic assumption. Again, it can be relaxed. And we can write down the likelihood. Um, we have the capture history. Uh, we have to consider the case now of might be recovered dead and probability of being, not being observed again, this chi term, which is modify a little bit. It's not too bad a modification. It's been done, done about 20 years ago, fairly straightforward to do this. How do we do this in the hidden Markov model framework? Well, previously we had two states, alive and dead. And now we have three states because of this, we can only recover recently dead animals. So we now have alive animals, recently dead animals and long dead animals. So we have three possible states. Um, and then we just have to know, we have the same data as we've just seen. We have to write down these different transition probability matrix and so on. Um, but they're very easy to modify and they're very similar. So what I've done, the blue bits are the new bits effectively. Oh, I should have said that on the last slide. So our transition, how do we move between states? Now we have alive, recently dead, long dead. Um, where we write alive, we go alive, alive to dead, can't become long dead. Um, and then deterministic, once we die, we then, the next time point will be long dead. Once we're long dead, we stay long dead. Our observation process matrix, we now have, a, uh, have to consider the case of also being recovered. But again, it's very, very similar to before. Uh, let's take the case where we're not observed. Well, if we're alive, probability of not being observed is 1 minus p. If we're recently dead, the probability of not being observed is 1 minus the recovery probability. And if we're long dead, we can't be observed, so the probability of not being observed is 1. If we're observed, and then we can do each of the other cases. Um, but this has all changed. The only thing I have to change is these, these transition probability matrix, observation process matrix, initial state distribution adds an extra um, uh, dimension because we can't state. Likelihood stays exactly the same. So I think this is much easier than having to derive the previous likelihood. Let's make it more complicated again. Now I'm going to assume that um, we have this, this often observed, for example, if you have partial monitoring, that animals that are alive may or may not be able to be observed. So the, I think of the case here where we are monitoring a colony of birds, but we only partially monitor the colony. We're only looking at certain, in our case, we were looking at breeding ledges. So what happens with individuals? They can leave the breeding ledge and go somewhere to another part of the island, breed on another part of the island, um, but we can't observe them anymore because we're only looking at a particular part of the island, the breeding colony. So they're still alive, but we can't observe them. But if they die, most deaths are then occurred because the animals are picked up in the water surrounding the, the island. It doesn't matter where on the colony they are, they can still be recovered dead. So we have an availability issue for animals that are alive may or may not be available for capture, but all animals are available for recovery. So now we have this availability parameter gamma uh, that we have to add in. And this is where things then start to get tricky. If we go back to the standard way of trying to derive the CJS likelihood, um, blank, so I was working this with Blanca Sarzo, um, we spent many hours writing things like this on a whiteboard. 
Um, sorry, it's not very clear. It doesn't matter it's not very clear because it's horrible. Uh, and, and you had to think, well, what happens? What's the probability of this happening? What's the... Uh, and we spent, and, and every time, basically what happened is we try and write it and then we take a photo and then we sit at it and go, actually, that's not right. I think this is the correct version. That that does, that does doesn't, that's not quite right. And it's, it was really non-trivial. And we have age dependence, time dependence and so on. So this is where the hidden mark of model really helps. So this is, this is horrible. The whole point is I don't care what's written on there. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's horrible. That's all I want you to show, show you. How do you do this as a HMM? And this is how you do it as a HMM. One slide, no, no complexity really, not comparatively. We just have to now think what, what states we have. Now we've got, um, so we've got, no, we, all we do is split our alive state into two parts, alive and available, alive and unavailable. And then we've got our dead animals again, uh, recently and long dead. And now we consider our transition probability matrix between each of these pairs of states. So. If we are alive and available for capture, the probability we're alive and available for capture the next time point is, well, we have to survive and we have to remain available. So we do not become unavailable. So there's one minus gamma. If we go from alive and available to alive and unavailable, then we survive, but now we, we're unavailable. And we can't, once we become unavailable, because of the life cycle of these ant burls, basically they're very um, faithful to, to where they breed, we can't see them again. So it's a permanent, my permanent migration to unavailable. Um, uh, we can become alive and dead, uh, can't become long dead. And then I say, so now we go alive and unavailable. We cannot now become avail available again. If we're unavailable, we, we stay unavailable. We might stay alive. So we go from alive to alive, but still unavailable, or we might die. And the deaths stay the same. Our observation process matrix, we just have to allow for this other... Um, state of being alive and unavailable for capture. If we're unavailable for capture, but alive, then with probability one, we're unavailable. Um, and the likelihood does not change. The likelihood stays the same. This, this red expression hasn't changed. And I, I, this is so much better, I can tell you, than that previous slide. Um, this was able to derive in five lines in 10 minutes. The other thing took hours and we had several mistakes and so on. And it's more, definitely more than five lines. So this is where the HMM framework has really benefited um, this area. Um, and, and it continues. So we can extend this, uh, the idea of the CJS model. Um, now, not thinking about recovery and availability, but we often have what's called multi-state capture, recapture data. So we're not necessarily just seen alive, but we're seen in a particular state. Um, that might be, for example, breeding or not breeding, or it could be um, a geographical location, different physical colonies. Uh, and again, now we can do exactly the same, uh, same type of thing. Uh, our pra parameters that we're interested in now also will have this um, state dependence typically may not, but um, for generality, we assume that survival and um, capture may be also dependent on, on our uh, um, state. Or, uh, state's probably not the best word here, because um, uh, I've used it for a latent state as well, but um, I've used it, so I'm probably going to stick, it, stick with it. Uh, and then we have an additional parameter, the probability of moving between these different, different states. Um, and again, so we, you know, you can derive the likelihoods explicitly, but putting it into the hidden Markov model framework is again very, very straightforward. The number of states we have now, a latent states, is just simply the number of states, alive states plus death, and then we can think about moving between all these different states. We just have, well, we we either move between alive, we have to count for that we're alive, plus we move between our these different states, um, or we die, stay dead once we're dead. Um, our observation process matrix just expands now because we have all these many different states and we have the probability we've seen in that state. Well, typically we assume that we can only be observed in a state um, if we're in that state. So uh, we get this nice looking like this. Uh, minor changes on initial state just to ignore this. Um, and then we get, again, the point is we get exactly the likelihood contribution. All we need to do is redefine these matrices. And again, this isn't too bad to write down in a normal way, but this still simplifies it. But you can get, where, where the advantages come in of writing in the HMM framework is that you get extensions of these as well, that um, sometimes if you observe an animal alive, we might not also record its state. We might not know whether it's breeding or not breeding. Um, so we may have a, a, an unknown state. Alternatively, we may have um, 
I said we assume that if you, a bird is in a given state, we observe it in that state. Well, you might not. You might have some misclassification. If you've got breeding and not breeding, you could think an animal is, is not breeding and it could be breeding, if it's near or, or vice versa. So if an animal is near a nest but not physically on a nest, you might not know it's breeding. You might classify it as a breeder or not breeder, and it could be wrong. So there could be some misclassification. Um, and what's really interesting in those, these cases, we only, given the previous one we had, both of these things I'm talking about, that the, we either may have an additional state of not, uh, observed state of not knowing what state we're in or having this misclassification, that only affects the observation process, which is another thing of splitting up the system process and the observation process. We might not, it doesn't change how the animals are moving between the states and so on. It's just saying what we observe. So we just have to change the observation process. And another thing um, I'm only going to briefly mention, and the details are too technical really for this talk, is that one thing I've struggled with and worked with over the years is where we often have um, individual time-varying continuous covariates. So we might, if we might have um, the condition of an animal may change over time, and this is often, for example, a weight is often used as a proxy for condition. Animals with of better condition may have higher survival probabilities than animals with lower condition and so on and it can affect whether they're breeding or not um, and dealing with time continuous um, individual time varying covariates is tr tr tricky because if you don't see an animal you don't know what its underlying covariate is because you don't know it's white because you haven't seen it and how you deal with that and incorporate that within these studies and that's been a long-standing problem but um, you can actually basically do a HMM approximation previously remember I said about state space models if you had continuous states you can do a discretization and an approximation of a hidden Markov model to that state space model. This is exactly what we have in that situation. So this is really, really cool. That's a, what the, I think this is one of the neatest solution I've ever come up with. It was joint with, um, with Roland Langlock. Anyway, so I'll briefly mention each of these. So, as I said, so suppose we've got missing or unknown states. So we, we're either in a... We may observe data, not observe an animal, observe an animal in the state, or say, well, we observe an animal, but we don't know what state it's in. Um, we may have an NA. You can again, write, writing down um, this, the, the, the likelihood in traditional form is pretty challenging. Writing as a HMM is really, really easy. We just have an additional parameter, which is sort of our state recording parameter. What, what do we observe? Do we actually observe uh, a state? Um, and that will be dependent on what state we're in. Uh, the transition probability matrix stays the same. All we change is the observation matrix. We have to allow for if we observe an animal, then there's a probability we've correct, we've uh, recorded the state. And then if we don't know the state, then we have to have the probability we, we don't record the state, but we do see an animal. And so on. Likelihood stays the same. Similarly for misclassification, which is an extension of the NA um, example we just had, that now we can have the problem where we, can, we might not be in the state we think we're in, and we have this misclassification. Again, the only thing that changes is the observation process matrix, and we have to consider if we're in state two, well, we may may have actually been in state one. There's this misclassification. Um, again, it's just changed the observation matrix. In this way, the likelihood stays the same. Writing down, again, this was another one of my, before I realised this was a HMM, um, work with Rachel McRae, we spent ages, actually this time it was in a coffee shop, um, largely speaking, uh, writing down lots and lots of, of, of formulae on, on pieces of paper. Horrible. HMM, straightforward. This is one of my most favourite pieces of work I've ever done, is uh, with these individual time varying covariates. The details are just uh, uh, too, too, too much to put on here, but basically we discretize. So we assume, previously we have, if you think we've got a continuous value, weight, um, we discretize the values that the animal could be, the weight could be positive in this case, just to do a fine discretization, about 50, I think, I think we did, and we just put that into the HMM framework. And we can, the interesting thing here, though, is we can still work, the system process still works on how the weight changes continuously over time. And we can import that into the, into the transition probability matrix, which is quite cool. So we're still working at the continuous state level, it's continuous value level, but we're just doing a discrete approximation. So getting there now, the, the final example I'm going to mention um, is that stopover model. Um, and this is slightly different to the previous ones because up until now, I've always conditioned on the first time that we see an animal. 
And I said, you can't then estimate um, birth rates or population size. Well, at least not in the traditional way. Um, we can actually uh, remove that condition. So this is much more recent work, uh, largely led by um, Shirley Pledger. Uh, and here we now we think about when animals enter, we remove that condition the first time we see an animal, we allow an animals to enter into the population. And when we do that, again, we now have a new parameter of an entry population, an entry probability. But now we, can, we have to sum over all possible times an individual could have entered the population and it gets a bit messy. And particularly if you want to make it more complicated, this gets very messy. Um, stopover model in the HMM, straightforward. We have another state. Um, basically, we have before entry into the population and in the population and exit the population. We already had within an exit. Now we just had the, the, the entry part to come with that. So we have this new state zero and the transition probability matrix come back to be really nice and simple again uh, and, and everything follows again. So just to show that it's really relatively quite, quite simple to do this and we don't have to work at all these horrible summations, they all come nicely into the, um, into the standard likelihood. There is a slight change uh, that we haven't seen before is that initial state distribution, uh, previously I said, well, we know when we see an animal. Uh, we always know it's alive. Now, actually, um, we don't necessarily know that. Um, so we have, uh, this becomes uncertain, and now we, we now go over all time points. We don't condition on the first time we see an animal. So there's some little nuances, but they're really straightforward. And, and I mean, I've, I've given, so the whole point, I was given you sort of a, an overview of lots of different examples of, hopefully, I, I'm trying to persuade you, the HMMs are really quite interesting. And if they're applicable to the study that you're interested in, doing extensions to these is relatively straightforward. And there's loads, I said, this, this continues. So um, this observation about hidden Markov models or CJS model being able to be written as a hidden Markov model was only around about uh, 2008 that this observation was made. Um, so that's now about 50 years after, just under 50 years, that, that the CJS model um, came about. Um, and you can see how many examples now there have been. And it's made us to do some of these things much easier, like including continuous covariates. And it continues, so we can have continuous time, uh, things where we've got irregular uh, time between observations. Um, so that was work with Sina Muse and, and Roland Langrock uh, and Nicola Quick. Um, we can combine these things, so I've got multi-state uh, stopover models. So combining the multi-state and the stopover cases you saw before, if you try to do this um, in the traditional way, it gets very messy very quickly. Within the HMM it's much, much simpler. So this was work with um, uh, Hannah Worthington and Rachel McRae. Uh, so Hannah was a PhD student and she's a lecturer in St Andrews. Um, the multi, we can say, we, well we assume now that um, this, this first order Markov, well for some cases that might not be the case that you know how long you stay in a state may depend on how long you've been in the state. This might not have this memoryless property that only depends on your current time point. So you can actually extend these now because we the, the work done in the HMM world are saying well you can approximate a semi-Markov model by a H uh, um, a standard HMM. We can apply this to to the CJS model really easily. And then this was done with Ronald Langrock talking about um, it was um, disease status of a bird. Uh, and then you can and you can and it's something called spatially explicit uh, capture recapture, which Ricky knows uh, a lot more about because it's very related to, to to his work. So this is where we have arrays of traps and so on. But the, it's really nice that putting this into the HMM makes this much much simpler to deal with these complexities, and which means we can learn more about the study that we're interested in, and, and um, particularly then this has implications for say for conservation and management a lot of the time. So hopefully, um, I managed to show you HMMs are useful. Uh, I think they're particularly useful in static ecology, and I mean the, the power of them is really becoming um, quite well used now. It's, it's been a huge explosion, as I say, in the last less than 15 years of this observation, how we can do all these, these very interesting um, things. And one thing I think is an is a added bonus um, with these is because we separate the system process from the observation process. We do this naturally because that's how it arises. But it also means when you're talking to ecologists, you, 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 you're able to 
to decouple these processes and say, okay, what's happening on the ground? What's the truth? What's really happening here? What's what's happening with you know? Uh, we can focus on the processes that as, as of the population over time. And then, okay, well, now we understand that. What, what are we observing? And then you have the observation process. And this decoupling really helps the conversation, I think, in understanding what's happening at the different parts of this partitioning out, which, yes, it happened before, but it wasn't quite as explicit. Uh, I think that's made life a lot simpler um, and has been really, really um, helpful. So anyway, so hopefully I've convinced you these are very interesting and stats ecology is, is quite interesting as well if you, you didn't think it was already. Uh, I just want to finish um, by th thanking the many, many, many collaborators I've worked on over the years and continue to work on in problems um, in this area. So uh, I'll stop there and say thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the wonderful talk. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> so now we get ready for the Q and A sessions. So if any of you have a question, please type on the chat, or you can send a question directly to me. But just to wrap up Drug's talk today, so here we have uh, the introduction to the H and M, and also a few examples of the how H and M can be easily implemented in many uh, different models like CGAs. Yeah. Honestly speaking, I spend one or two years to learn about all this model. And this is very short, short introductions within an hour that you have to understand all these kind of things. So if you want to learn more about this H&M, so you can have a look at the reference that Ruth mentioned about uh, before the book. So you can have a look and it's very useful and very practical in practice. So yeah, that's the H&M for you. It's very, very efficient. So yeah. Uh, we're waiting for the question. Actually, uh, I got some question coming to me. So I think this is a bit more like uh, general questions, right? So the question is like, in, in Indonesia, maybe it's not that familiar that we have uh, this kind of capture, recapture data for myself itself. I never seen the capture, recapture data collected. So let's say that we want to start uh, this. The question is that what are the best practice like to design the appropriate experiment? For example, uh, if you want to know like the density as uh, of the population or the abundance. So how do we like determine how big the area that we should uh, study area that we should collect and like how much, uh, how many periods of study that we should and also uh, like the locations and how many number of individuals that we should collect. And yeah, I think it's kind of like general questions, the best practice to uh, design experiment. So the, f the first thing with any of this is to, what is the actual question that's being of primary interest? So that's that should always derive, um, uh, drive what the study is. So if you're interested in, um, abundance at a particular time then you might do something different than if you're interested in what are the survival probabilities you're interested in so you think about what is the primary questions that you're interested and in. typically it's not, not necessarily focusing on one but you know having a list of what what they are um, for example if you want to know about density then um, you probably want to do this over an area you know what defines what area you want and you might want to whereas if you're doing other things um, if you want to know for example uh survival probabilities how that changes over habitats then you have to collect data across different habitats so that's the type of thing i mean it depends what questions you're asking how then your best study design is still an open question um but there are certain things that to be thinking about um how often do you go and collect the data is 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 definitely uh one of them and uh how long do you do that for so if you're interested in annual survival then you know going out mm -hmm. once a year is fine if you're interested in um survival over different parts of the life cycle that may mean going more frequently if you want to it depends on what the, the um biological life cycle of the species you're interested in as well that will be telling you what the, what the answers to these are um but so that that's that's really not answering the question and saying it depends what the question is and there's no actual answer but i, I would say that i think that there's now 
The good practice would be to use some of the modern ideas and in particular spatially explicit capture recapture. So normally I said you go and capture animals. Um, and again, it depends how easy it is to capture animals. Um, if it's if they're more elusive to capture or you're interested in, in more spatial area, then you would perhaps you would set up these arrays of traps. And motion, motion sensor cameras are sort of the obvious thing that is now used. It's not the only one you can do acoustic and so on. So that is, I would say, is probably good practice to do a spatial arrays rather than just thinking of one small area of doing this. But again, it does depend, as I say, um, on the animals. Maybe the capture recapture is not the best thing to be doing either. Um, distance sampling might be uh, worthwhile to do where you do transect sampling and so on. Um, that's really where you're interested in, in abundance primarily. Um, capture recapture has been more prevalent on um, survival. So there's no single fixed answer. It will also depend on resources because these things are not done independently of resourcing. So I think the main the main thing is really is to setting up studies is good to have a conversation at, at the beginning, not just thinking about how do we collect the data is also what data analytical, what questions we're asking, what data do we need to answer these and what techniques are we going to use to analyze them? Think about all of that all in one go that will help say what what is most uh, what might be the best practice to go th to, to do this pilot studies might also be useful as well because some things may be unknown to try and fine-tune these things so it's also an iterative process with these things so i think it's worth it's i describe statistical ecology as a very early data science um that statisticians and ecologists working together closely has been going on for about over 100 years because of the 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 the, the clear um, benefit you get of this, and I think it's worth it's worthwhile keeping that in mind as well. That it's the whole part. You need the biology to understand what you need to do, but you also need to have um, the data analytics aspect at the beginning. So sorry, that was a very long answer for. There's no real okay. single answer to this, um, and it's probably okay. the best thing is to have a dialogue um, at the start. With okay. So just to extend the previous question before I read the question in the chat. So if we really know the, the purpose of like what research question that we want to answer. So can we do for a cost efficiency, like can we do the simulation study? I mean the simulation, yeah, simulation study before we like design experiments. So for example, we set some parameters. So I want kind of this uh, experiment. So then in order to minimum the bias and so forth and then I need at least this kind of thing to in order to accurately estimate the abundance, something like that. So, yeah, I mean that was what I was sort of um, thinking about with doing sort of a pilot study because how do you know the parameters to be using that? So you know, in, in traditional okay. statistical thing, you do a power analysis. Um, they're not very easy to do with these things, but yeah, so that type of thing is okay. If I have, if I assume this is the this is sort of what I think is best, uh, these are the parameters. Do a simulation. How does that work? And so on, is a good thing to be doing. Uh, but that might need to be as an iterative once once you go out and realize these things. Okay, cool. So, okay, there is a question here. So I think this question is related to the obtained valid uh, inference about the parameter of interest. Is there minimal samples as we got for the model? So I'm assuming that many of the models is estimated using the Bayesian framework. So. What said that we only estimate them using the frequency slide issue. Is there any minimum or assumption that we need to be aware as well? So, I mean, they will, but it will be. And it's to do, well, um, in the sense, typically you have, you don't have control over the number of individuals that you see. What you do have control over is the number of capture occasions, or the if you're doing continuous time, the length of time that you're you're there. Um, it it becomes fairly apparent fairly quickly if you don't have a big enough sample size because you just get I mean if you don't see any animals clearly you can't do that if you see one animal you're not going to get that much information uh, and so on but it normally I mean some studies will work with relatively I mean I've seen studies for like 20 30 individuals and you can get some information but it will be weak than if you have more so there's no there will be a minimum sample size and I don't know what that is, but it's it's smaller than than perhaps you'd think. That the having two or three 
capture occasions is too small probably as well. Again, I haven't seen a study on it where I have seen some work being done. Again, this is going back to the previous question rather than sample size. Um, first part I think it's worth mentioning is where we have said, we talk about these spatial arrays, how close the arrays need to be get together is really important or how far, uh, Ricky knows this all too well with his recent work. Um, that if you have traps that are too far apart, so animals are not see, don't move far enough to be seen by multiple traps, that causes issues. Uh, so that is sort of a sample size issue that in a slightly different way. So it's not just the actual number of animals that you see, but it's also the pattern that, that, that you see um, has to be taken into account. Um, but no, I mean, 2030 is, it depends on, on the animals because very elusive animals are very small populations. Um, you yeah. do see those types of numbers. Do work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. So yeah, and also the capture recapture data is just one of kind of ecological data. There are many, many, so many data outside there. So one of the data that we are currently working on is the unmarked one. So where we, there is no need for the individual identifications. So we don't really know the distinct number of individuals. So we just know the total number of detections. So it can also be used, there is a, a different models for that. I'm not sure whether there is kind of like h &M for this uh, unrecognized well, you, you, you can think about it is, if you think about that because you can do the data augmentation and actually say you've got, you've got all these unmarked animals, but you can impute as, a, as again, another latent state, you could think of latent state being individuals and we assign actual observations to individuals. Um, and then, then you update what those are as well. So, or do you have to sum over all of them, sort of latent states? Um, so, in some sense, the HMM can become into that. Where I think it's more likely to become prevalent, because I, I don't think that's very efficient. Although I know um, someone that uh, Ricky and I are talking to, they think it is quite efficient. And when that, one of our next tasks will be actually doing a comparison of these methods. So what Ricky's been yeah. doing compared to this other uh, link. Okay, actually guessing effectively what they are. Um, individual histories are, is you often get now data where you get both combination of marked and unmarked animals. And then, and then you've got this combination of them, them both, which is quite interesting. Um, but you can separate them nicely. So again, you've got the nice HMM stuff if you want to use it for the, for the marked animals and then how you do it for the, uh, the unmarked. Again, I think the way Ricky's doing it is better. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions left? Uh, before we stop for today's work talk. Yeah. Okay, we have one. Okay, Masigit, please Hello. unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, yeah. can you hear my voice? Thank you. Yes. Good. Hello, Ruth. Uh, introduce my name. My name is Sigit from Indonesia. And I think it's quite new for me. And yeah, uh, you did a very great work and it's a very big, I guess. And I have a um, question. First of all, um, you you give some figures in the corner of your slide. And it, in, uh, it interested me that uh, what is the, <laughs> what is the, the, the mean of this figure? Because I, I don't have uh, any idea to relate this figure to the Markov. <laughs> process would you like to uh, explain me thank you which, which figures uh, like a skeleton of <laughs> oh uh, the skeleton <laughs> yes <laughs> like this this was meant to be a a, a slide i did actually ask to ask ricky whether the phrase <laughs> translated a skeleton in the cupboard it means sort of like this thing that keeps the thing that keeps coming out and jumping out at you um and the reason for those figures of the skeletons is if and most of the if I, if I, i've still got my share my screen i probably should have stopped that but i'll just i go yeah. back that's yeah. yes, like um, that. Yeah. So, this, yeah. one, this is a, this is a skeleton of a sheep because if you look at the paper at the bottom, that was the sturdy species that we analysed in that paper. So they were all um, linked to the the papers that um, were have been published on the, the species that were analysed in those papers. So that was a sheep. That that one was a random one because I ran out of animals. Um, that was a, a small bird. I can't remember what it is. That, that was that was a, a goose. Because uh, it's a famous data set of of Canada geese. Uh, I was a guillemot and so on. So yeah, sorry. So they were related to those um, papers. Sorry, I should have said that probably. 
<laughs> so in the last thing. <laughs> and, okay. uh, the second uh, the second is I think it's not question but uh, um, you showed that for any example that you give uh, we can see that the like the code contribution has the same pattern. Um, I think it's uh, it's quite difficult to uh, to show or to prove but the 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 more the more thing that uh, attract me to analyze more is when you give a sample of misclassification and you add uh, alpha uh, but um, yeah we still have the same pattern of likelihood contribution and uh, so uh, it, it inspires me to how how uh, what I, I mean uh, what is the the next information that we can find that we can uh, infer from the from this uh, this form from this likelihood form? Uh, do you get so the, my question? <laughs> so I mean, this is actually called a multi. So this is a typically been called a multi-event model. I said it was done in the pre-HMM framework by Roger Pradell. Um, but again, what we're particularly interested in is we're interested in not this observation process. We're not interested in at all. It's basically nuisance parameters. And it's just saying, what do, how do we, what we're interested in and what's happening at the system process. And what's happening at the system process is, is what we have here, the transition probability matrix, the, pro, the survival probabilities and the probability of moving between states. Yeah. So that's what we're interested in. And then we said we can do this in the Bayesian framework and the classical framework. You know, we just need the likelihood to feed into our favorite process that we want to analyze it. Um, so we're not interested in, in that. But if we ignore, if there is misclassification um, in, in the states that are being recorded, if we ignore that, we can get bias in our estimates of the survival and these transition probabilities or typical migration probabilities psi. So that's what we're interested in. The classification bit, we're typically not, we might just per se out of interest be, well, how, how accurate are we at estimating them? We might be interested in that, but it's this is what we're really interested in is the system process. What What's driving it? How are they moving between the different states or locations? Um, and what's their survival probabilities and how is that related to, and the survival probabilities will typically be a function of these different states as well. So it's a way of correcting for potential bias because of misclassification. Typically, I'm interested in it. Does, does that answer the question? Yes, okay. Uh, it's still difficult to understand for me because it's new, but uh, I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I okay. The detail of all this was way too much. I mean, I, I, I did like 10 papers worth. <laughs> yeah. um, the whole point was the detail is, is, is less interesting. It's the fact we can write this as a hidden mark model and we can, and what we're interested in is estimating the model parameters. And we can do that mm. because we can write down the likelihood function. Um, but yes, yeah. no, no, so the details, yes, I completely agree. Way too much detail. Okay. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Ricky. Okay. Yeah, I think that should be the final question, I think, because we're running out of time. So thank you again, Rod, for giving us a very wonderful talk and open our mind about the NGNM and how fast the research in statistical ecology. So before we stop our today's webinar, I think, uh, uh, there is a certificate of appreciation from the School of Statistics, and it will be given by Irma Fitria. So can you share the screen? Yeah. Okay, so this is just a little appreciation for us, for you, Ruth. <laughs> so we really appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, you want to say something? Much. Okay, so we really appreciate for your uh, talks today. And yeah, before, again, before we stop, I think we should do some screen capture for today's moment. So yeah, everyone, if you want to open your camera, please open now because we're gonna take some screenshots and we'll see to have a look everyone with nice smiles. Yeah, <laughs> otherwise that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's about the iftar time in Indonesia, so everyone feel like yeah, a bit tired and exhausted. Maybe also looking forward to 
iftar. Yeah. <laughs> so, are you ready? Okay, I will count one, two, and three. Uh, what is it? What's it? More? Yes. I think so. Okay. Yeah. I finish. Okay, cool. Okay, I think that should wrap up for our today's webinar. Thanks again, Ruth, for coming and give uh, a very wonderful talk. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. I'll see you again in any upcoming uh, events from the School of Statistics. Okay, thing should be, and have a nice day, everyone. Thanks thank again you. for inviting me, my, my first Indonesian talk. Thank you. Oh, that's nice, Ruth. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Ruth. Thank you. Nice. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Ricky. Okay. Bye. Thank you everyone for coming. Yes, thank you.